I like to describe mangroves as effectively the underdog of the forestry sector. For one, uh, people don't actually think mangroves are trees. They think they're shrubs. They certainly look like shrubs. They don't necessarily have that beautiful, long, heroic looking profile that a tree has. They're not pretty, they, you know, from the, from certainly from afar, they're not pretty. They don't look particularly inviting. So it's not really like you would think of them as a forest or something as a tree. That was the experience for myself because, you know, having grown up in Canada, being surrounded by trees, forests, I was naturally yearning for a similar experience here in the Middle East. And of course, being surrounded by sand, there's not that many trees around, understandably. But luckily, along the coastline, you do find mangrove forests. And so, you know, thanks to my passion for trees and all things green, I was attracted to these mangrove forests here in Dubai. Check them out, see what's what's going on. And you have to go inside them, kayak through them. And I realized, oh, wow, these are actually pretty beautiful, beautiful forests. And there's actually a lot of, a lot of action in these forests, both in terms of like bird life, fishing, animals. There's a whole party happening in these mangrove forests that I had not been aware of. And it's quite alluring and also you can already see from a climate impact how as you go through a mangrove forest it's a cooler environment because it keeps the temperatures down compared to an area where there is no trees and certainly no mangroves and so as you look through the water you can see you know an entire world of fish that are there because the fish actually lay their eggs in, inside the roots of the mangrove trees and it serves as a nesting environment for fish to spawn. And this is why whenever there's mangroves, there's a lot of fishing activity. And this is what's the beautiful part about mangroves is that it's the only tree that could actually grow in water, that it doesn't need to be on dry land all the time. It in fact needs tidal water for it to actually blossom. And it could also be found in over a hundred countries which are tropical or subtropical. So it's much more widely dispersed than you would think. But at the same time, it's also quite a finite resource. If you look at the, the entire forest's wealth of the world, uh, the forest footprint of the total footprint of forests in the world, only 3% represent mangrove forests. So it's a very small percentage of the total forest reserves that we have, which represent mangroves. But nevertheless, in many countries, they are seen as the guardians of the coast because they help shield those communities against natural disasters, such as cyclones and tsunamis. And so whilst they may be finite and little, they certainly play a, you know oversized role, both in terms of biodiversity for fish, for birds, for animals, as well as in terms of providing protection for coastal communities. And a third superpower that they have, as it turns out, is that they're a great source of carbon capture. They're able to sequester five, 10 times, depending on the species of mangrove, more carbon dioxide than conventional terrestrial trees. And so for every one ton per hectare that you're able to capture and sequester from a normal forest, a same forest the size would be able to sequester five tons. So you're getting a lot more carbon capture per hectare through these wonderful mango forests than you would from a terrestrial forest. And at a time where climate change is more important than ever and our efforts to capture and to sequester these harmful, nasty pollutants from the air into the ground, then the mangrove tree becomes your front line in this campaign, in this battle, as it sucks in more carbon than any other tree and is able to sequester it for over a thousand years.